Welcome to God Killer Last Hope. My name is Zoe Williams, and as the dramaturg for this production, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the viciously divine world of The Cradle. Last Hope is a dark fantasy series that deals with heavy topics, and content warnings will be shared before the show begins. Last Hope is performed live and in studio by Connie Chong and C. Thomas. God Killer Last Hope is a dark fantasy actual play series that deals with serious and potentially triggering topics. Viewer discretion is advised. Content warnings for this episode include fantasy violence, death, killing, blood, emotional negligence by a parent, sacrifice, trauma, grief, interpersonal conflict, demons, ghosts, monsters, body horror, divinity, and brief mentions of divine cannibalism, suicide missions, and spitting. This is not a story about killing gods. Yes, it is. This is not a story about redemption. Yes, it is. This is a story about one thing and one thing only. Bullshit. This is my story. This is your story, told from the mouths of gods. No, no, it's not. This is my story, and I'm the one telling it this time, and I know what it's about. It's about purpose. It's about redemption. It is about redemption. It's about me killing the God that I was made to kill. It's about seeing that clear line and walking from beginning to end, which some people might mistake for ruthlessness, but I know it's just another word for absolution. Maybe, 你说的话有道理, but maybe not. This is a story about you, Litany, the God Killer, and your mortal heart. Bullshit. Have a seat, Litany. That's... That's not what my story is about. Then why couldn't you kill me? I tried. I tried. I... I had your heart in my hands. I could feel it. I wanted to. I was supposed to. I was made to. But you didn't die. You didn't. The story begins as it is fated to end with hatred plunged through the chest of a god. Litany, your hand is buried fingers to hilt in the chest of the immortal Emperor Long Du, devourer of the devouring, grand adjudicator of the game, sovereign on high of Yaolan, the amethyst dragon. Blood patters onto the immaculate wooden floorboards of the Hall of Peerless Destiny, the throne room of the City of Heaven, the Realm of Gods. And this blood is red. The color of a mortal's blood, the color of the blood that runs through your veins. Lung Du inhales once sharply. Her hair is long, long as the shattered river, as dark as the void between stars. Her face is an aberration of beauty, much too handsome for mortal eyes to behold. And yet, you behold it. And Lung Du says to you, What are you? I... 
I am a litany of hatred, and I was born to kill you. So die, why won't you die? And as you twist your hand inside her chest, you feel the crimson running between your fingers and you feel something warm. Your home is cold, you are cold, all you have ever known is cold. This warmth sits strange and heavy against your flesh. And the immortal emperor says, a litany of hatred. And something similar to familiarity glimmers in her eyes. She blinks and she looks at you with those dark eyes, those wine dark eyes as dark as a storm-tossed sea. And you know she's trying to see you, but something's preventing her from fully seeing you. You know what it is, she doesn't. Your mother's protection. And Lungdu says, <laughs> well, no matter who you are, no matter what you are, I am the immortal emperor of heaven and you have attempted to break the law of abstention. No, I'm going to do it. You're going to die. A god cannot kill another god. It is forbidden. We cannot bring back the devourer. I cannot allow this to go unpunished. And she puts her hand down against your wrist and starts to pull your hand out of her chest. Do you resist? I do resist with okay. everything I have. Okay, I need you to attempt fate. <gasps> oh God, why wasn't I ready for that? <laughs> All right, so when you want to tempt fate, roll 2d6 and say what perilous feat you're trying to accomplish. I was born for this. Mm. I was made for this. I'm supposed to kill her. I'm going to kill her. And that is the perilous feat that I'm still, even as she's pulling my hand out of her chest, <laughs> trying to accomplish. Okay, so you're going to have to also add one for each true statement. One of these three, a skilled ally is lending you a hand. No. You are completely alone. Uh, you have no other options. There is no other option. That's true. And you're far from any god that wishes you harm. That is not uh, true at all. Nope, she's trying to get rid of you. Uh, so that's a plus two. Okay. Five, three, plus two, ten. That's a ten. That's an overkill. Uh, so you triumph over this specific ordeal, but attract the attention of your enemies. They react immediately. I think it's pretty obvious what happens here. Okay, so she pushes your hand out of her chest, and by you triumphing, this means she doesn't break your arm off of your body. But with her other hand, uh, she draws the sword that's been sheathed at her waist. And you see a tempered diamond edge coming out, a noise-like song as it comes out of the sheath. And it's a translucent blade, pure diamond. And it catches the light filtering through the tall windows coming into the Hall of Peerless Destiny perfectly. You recognize this blade. Your mother has told you about this, has prepared you for this moment. This is absolution. It was once named Malice. I'm sorry for this. No, 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 no! I don't want to do this. But a breaking of the edict cannot go unpunished. You must die, you must die! I don't know what you are, for you are not any mortal I have seen, nor cultivator, nor god, nor demon. But what you do ends tonight and she draws absolution back, how do you guard against it? Two hands clasped in prayer in front of their chest. Okay. Uh, the sword comes forward, the point comes in, and you grab it. For a second, you think you can still it. For a second, you think you'll be able to maybe even break it to win here. But then she actually applies strength. This whole time, she had been merciful toward you. And now that mercy breaks. Whoosh, and absolution slides between your ribs and it pierces through you. And now you feel <laughs> cold. And when you cough, you see your own blood spattering onto these immaculate floorboards, joining the blood leaking from Long Du's chest. And as everything starts to fade, everything starts to go hazy, the amethyst pillars vibrating out of existence, the strange mist coalescing in the ceilings, you hear the immortal emperor's last words to you, a voice mixed with sorrow, but also finality. <laughs> you could not do it. You did not understand what it meant to be mortal. 
And that is the timber of my heart. That is why you failed. And I need you to mark five strain. Like all five? All five, yeah. Okay. That means I'm dead. That me <laughs> uh, yeah, that does mean you're dead. But when you hit five strain, that's a crucible move in this game. Uh, you choose whether you succumb or persevere. So which one would you like to do? Would you like to die right here right now? We could call it quits here. Uh, or would you like to persevere? There is no other option. I will not die here because I've never lived. Okay. Back into the river we go. So if you choose to persevere, roll d6. No modifiers. This is completely up to fate. Two or one? Two d6. Five. That's a miss. <laughs> That's a miss. Uh, so on a miss, which is a six and below, you fall unconscious. You get to clear one strain, so you're at four, and the GM will describe the desperate scene you find yourself in when you wake. Okay, Litany, you fall. You fall through those wooden floorboards of the Hall of Peerless Destiny. You fall through the entire city of heaven, glimpsing flowery archways, courtyards blooming with a life you've never seen before. You fall through the cradle, the mortal realm, Yaolan, all five great earthly kingdoms you see. You hit the ground and you fall through the ground, through the river that bisects the realms and into your home, the underworld. The underworld, also known as the ghost realm, is an infernal paradise. It exists stitched somewhere beneath the cradle, beneath Yaolan, and it is where mortal spirits go after they depart. It is also where demons live. It is the only home you've ever known. It is where you were created and where you have become yourself. Inside the underworld, there's no ceiling, not even really a sky. Just a banquet of darkness, perforated by a constant hazy red light. Everything is red here. We glimpse as you plummet, desiccated courtyards blooming with ghastly flowers. We see vine-choked stone bridges, canals of blood flowing underneath them. We see pleasure dens, lavish restaurants, temples to long forgotten gods, and of course, we see the denizens of the underworld, ghosts, those departed spirits, and demons, the gods of the underworld. And then you splash into the Crimson River. It is a river of blood that bends and winds through the underworld like a hungry red snake. It's shallow. It's always been shallow. The water, no, the blood is barely enough to break your fall before you slam into this liquid and you hit the bottom of the riverbed. As the blood comes over them, the very same water that they were birthed from, the scream that comes out of Litany before they lose consciousness is not a scream of agony. It's not a scream of fear. It is a scream of rage so deep that it tears open their throat. You feel your vocal cords ripping. And then the blood flows in. Your eyes flutter and everything goes black. Litany, you were not born in the traditional sense. You were spun into being from a shard of the queen's rib a drop of her blood, and a fragment of that sacred blade that still lodged in her heart. And when you wake, it is to the sound of her voice. Your eyes flutter open. And you know this place, Litany. You know it well. You've been here many times, countless times. You are in the Hall of Stolen Chance the throne room of the underworld, the realm of ghosts and demons, and your mother's seat of power. All around you, you see pillars of twisting, porous bone, paper prayers dangling from arches of curved black jade, and we see a miasma of smoke 
from smoldering incense holders nearby. And at the very back of this hall, the ivory throne. It sits upon a raised dais surrounded by a moat of molten silver. And upon that throne, Queen Xi Gu, the first fallen beginning of the end, Lord of Death, sovereign on low of the underworld, the Silver Tilian. She wears robes of pure black, pitch black, shot through with silver embroidery, the same color as her silver eyes. And she has a black hua dian, shaped like a lotus bloom. She looks exactly like her sister, remarkably like her sister, now that you've actually feasted your eyes upon the immortal Emperor Longdu. And yet, She looks nothing like her as well. No, no, no. I, I... My queen, my queen. <laughs> Whitney takes in lungful after lungful of breath, and there is nothing that could have prepared them for this moment. Every single moment of their life was built for her, was built so that they could kill the immortal Emperor Longdu and they were there. And the words start to tumble out of Litany's mouth. I was there, I did it, I, I had it. I was so close, I was so close. I'm, 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 I, I, I. Enough. And that voice, those words, could cut diamond. And you hear it, an emotion enshrouding those words. Disappointment. You have disappointed her before. The disappointment isn't new, but it's the depth of it that is new. This is a disappointment that transcends wrath. You. You have ruined me. You are my downfall. No. You have no. failed me. You have failed the three tenants. You have failed the underworld. You have failed my vengeance. I could not have prepared you better for this moment. The fault lies not with the wielder, but the blade, and you are a broken blade. A worthless blade. A bastard blade. Please, I was so... I was so close. I, I should not. I. You're right. I am. I am. I am broken. Something was wrong. I couldn't. I had it. I had it. Close is not good enough. You had your chance. You have proven your worth. This is what you are worth. Nothing more, no. not a drop of blood more. Look me in the eyes, litany, vessel of hatred, before I unmake you as I made you. And I will tell you the story, the story you know, the story every demon, every ghost in the underworld knows, so you will know the depth of your failure before you go before oblivion takes you. And Tigu starts to plunge into a story that every being in the sister realms knows. This is the first story you ever heard. And this will be the last story you will ever hear. And as Tigu speaks, she starts to reach for the blade sheathed at her waist. And she says, I would like to do as I'm told. Okay, yes, that is a mortal move. I love that. So when you do as you're told, say how you show submission and answer one of the two following questions. And I will show you a glimpse of their true intentions as I answer the other question that you didn't pick. So the questions are, how are you rewarded? And what vulnerability do you reveal? Litany was on their knees already covered in blood, bathed in it. But if they could get lower, deeper than the underworld, 
they would have crawled there. They lay their forearms down on the stone in complete supplication, and they look up at her exactly as she instructs. Because that is all they've ever done. They have only done her instruction. They have done her will over and over and over, and they would have it no other way. There is nothing but submission Hmm. when it comes to Queen Siku. Hmm. They know nothing else. And if that means dying, if that means utter failure, so be it. So you're just, you're accepting your death. You're not pleading for your life. She has said, I'm gonna kill you. I'm gonna tell you a story before I kill you, but I'm going to kill you. And you don't resist. I have never spoken back. And I don't start today. Okay. Was that your answer to what vulnerability do you reveal? Yes. Okay. I will tell you how you are rewarded with that first story, with that last story, before oblivion comes. And Tigu says, Once upon a time, the cradle was whole. Gods, mortals, and ghosts walked freely among each other. There were no sister realms to speak of. There was just the realm, the cradle. The river was whole. It flowed freely between all of us. Mortals and ancestors, descendants and ghosts, gods and gods, we walked among each other. And then oblivion began to call to some of those gods. Their time was ending. A new era was to come, but they resisted. They struggled. They feared. They tried to hold on to their power, but they had none left. So they turned to each other. The first god to be slain was temperance. At the jaws of her brother, He bit down and he drank of her blood and he ate of her flesh and he grew strong. And the other gods saw and the other gods learned. And one by one by one, the gods began to eat each other. They turned into cannibals, you see. It gave them power, it let them survive and eventually they did it for pleasure. The devouring, that's what they called it. That's what I called it. 10,000 years of chaos and misery. And I, I was poised to rule it. I had a different name then, Long Tsi. When I was a mortal, a peasant girl from nowhere, you know the story, we all know the story. And yet I was destined for greatness. I was always destined for greatness. I killed and I ate and I became, I became Tigu. And I ruled. I slew every god that stood in my way. I devoured, I was great. Triumph was in my fingertips and then My sister, my poor, pathetic, sniveling, weak sister, Long Xia Feng, she was always the weaker twin, the soft-hearted one. She had not ascended. She was still mortal. She didn't know what godhood could be. She didn't understand the price, the cost, the sacrifice. The sacrifices needed to reach greatness. She slipped a sacred blade between my chest, blubbering about how it had to be done. She wept. (laughs) Can you imagine? She wept as she slew me. Me, Tigu, Lord of Death. The first fall. And fall I did. I fell, I fell, I fell. I became a ghost of a god. A god of a ghost. She killed me. But I did not die. There is a difference, Lenny. Oblivion tried to take me, 
but the blade she sank into my chest, I ripped it from her hands and it snapped. And she draws that blade now, it comes out, fushing judgment. The top half snapped off, still lodged in Tigu's chest, this whole time for millennia since her sister slew her. The top half gone, the stronger half, the better half, the half that was destined for greatness. And Tigu says, And as I struggled against my own oblivion, as I kept myself anchored to this nothingness, this nothing half-life, I watched for three thousand years in the veil between life and death. I suffered and I watched as Long Xie Feng became... What is it that she calls herself now? Jin Du, the amethyst dragon. I spit upon her name. And yet, she did it. She devoured the devouring. She did something you could not. She succeeded. She broke the world to save it in her eyes. And we call it the shattering. 1100 years ago, she shattered the cradle into three pieces, separated gods up into the city of heaven, mortals, on Yaolan, the cradle, and ghosts shattering down into the underworld. The separation to protect mortals, for it was divine conflict that caused misery for everyone else. And because of her weak, frail, soft heart, she took pity on me. What a humiliation. What a fucking disgrace. She made me queen appointed me ruler of this dead world, this underworld. And the gods who came down here when they achieved apotheosis, we called ourselves demons instead. We are still gods, but we simply live down here. We preside over ghosts. A reward? A mercy? Don't make me laugh. It's a humiliation. That's all it is. She's laughing at me. I know she is. Then I tried to kill her. Yes, I did so many times, using my river shard, surfacing through the ascension gate, going to the city of heaven, trying to exact my vengeance, that thing which keeps me tethered to life. But every time I ascended to the city of heaven, the call of the river, it grew stronger. The call of oblivion, it strengthened until I could not surface anymore. Which brings us to you. Litany. Vessel of hatred, the weapon I crafted from a shard of my rib, a fragment of the sacred blade, and a drop of my blood. I gave you life. I made you what you are. I gave you purpose. You were to be my weapon, to go where I could not. To slay Longdu so I could claim the throne, claim the greatness that was denied to me, that was stolen from me. And you failed. I've failed you. And that's the moment where it sinks in. Where every moment that had flitted by so fast that Litany could no longer comprehend it. That's when it sinks in. Mm. That's right. Oh, though I am filled with repulsion for you in this moment, the look in your eyes, don't look down, look at me. Now this almost makes my heart beat again. This despair. For you are a weapon that has not killed, and what good is a weapon that cannot kill? are worthless. And she draws the blade back. Those will be the last words you hear. You are worthless. And then movement from the shadows beside the throne. Even Tigu pauses, tilts her head to the side, and out steps. Sui Xin. Oh, you know them well. 
the twin blades of sorrow. Your mentor, the person who trained you, has trained you for over a hundred years. They are a demon who wears a doli, a steepled bamboo hat, and we see black tattoos curving up their exposed arms, tattoos of the shattered river, and a pair of swords cinched to the sash at their waist. And that doli is steepled over their eyes as always, even as they address not you, but the queen, they kneel. They do not dare look her in the eyes, in the face, but they do kneel and they do speak. And for the first time in their life, they interrupt what Tsigu is about to do. So you understand the gravity of what your mentor is about to ask for, to say, to interject about. And Sui Xin says, Oh, Lord of Death, please. I beg of you, not mercy, never mercy, but a second chance. I know that Litany can do better. I trained them to do better. Allow them another chance to serve as your blade. Broken though they are, a jagged edge can still cut. And for the first time since you've known her, Tsibu pauses. She hesitates. Do you say or do anything before she speaks? Not yet, but there is a layer of bafflement and things start to spin out of control in Litany's mind again. This is where the incomprehension comes back. Hmm. They don't understand what's happening right now. They don't know why, they almost crave it that death, because everything that Sibu said was right, why aren't they dead yet? They should be. They should be dead, why aren't they? And they watch the scene unfolding in front of them with empty, blank eyes getting redder and redder by the moment. Hmm. And the words that come from Sibu's mouth are addressed not to you, but to Suisi, and you know this. She says, <laughs> Now why should I listen to you, twin blades of sorrow? You failed me as well. You failed as a mentor, just as your student. But, perhaps there is some logic here that can be salvaged. Perhaps oblivion is too kind of fate for Litany and for you, Sui Xin. I know what needs to be done. A punishment of misery. Yes, death is too kind. Even torture in the needle pits would be too kind for you, Litany. At least then you would feel something. I know what your due is to be. You are to have an existence bereft of drive. You will be stripped bare of all purpose. That shall be your true punishment. As for you, twin blades of sorrow, you will never know the peace you came to the underworld so desperately, so pitifully to seek. I am consigning you for eternity to the role of gate guardian. Your assignment will reach you, Litany, when it is time. But until then, and impossibly, she draws judgment back away from your neck, away from your chest, and she sheaths it. You are dismissed. No. Where do I? Do not make me repeat myself. Go! Stumbling, covered in blood. Lost of purpose. Still alive. Still half alive. Still almost alive. Litany stumbles out of the hall of stolen chance. A god killer failed. And with that, Sui Xin, as well as the queen of the underworld, Tsigu, fade into the darkness as you exit the Hall of Stolen Chance and enter an unknown fate.
bathed in blood. Loss of purpose? Whitney goes. They have no other choice. There are three tenants that they've always lived by. And all of them ring in their ears with every step they take. Show no mercy. No, no pain. Kill or be killed. Every tenant they've broken. They have shown mercy. They have known pain. And they could not even be killed. They are broken. A broken god killer. And they have failed. This isn't how my story is supposed to go. Litany. A hundred years pass. The year is 1199 AG. You have spent every year in the past century eking out a dull existence as a soul shepherd, herding the wandering ghosts and infernal beasts of the underworld away from the shattered river, away from surfacing into realms where they don't belong. For these entities are broken, just like the river is and they are able to traverse the realms with an ease that even mortals, gods, and demons don't know. Everyone else has to use a river seal at an ascension gate. But spirits? The beasts you heard? They can simply walk. In some ways, they're free. Unlike you. We find you now in the obsidian fields that sprawl beyond the sepulchral heart of the necromantic palace. Litany, please tell me, what do you look like? Litany's eyes have always been red. Red like the drop of blood that made them. They've always had skin and hair the color of bleached bone. <laughs> dead, long dead and they've always had bruised knuckles because they were taught to be a weapon, not wield one. They fight with their hands. They fought with their hands. And those eyes used to have purpose, used to have drive, used to have fire, used to have everything that a god killer needed to succeed. And now they have nothing. Now, instead of watching gods fall by their hand, as many have, they watch infernal beasts roam obsidian grasslands. Instead of tying their knuckles tight with layers and layers of fabric, with knives, with blades, with puncturing weapons to throw their weight behind. Now they wrap their hands in rope, halters, <laughs> feed bags, meat. And now, instead of their feet taking them toward their destiny, they rest on the top of an obsidian fence post, staring out at a purpose that doesn't exist. A god killer with no god to kill. The sky is black, crimson light shines down. There are no seasons in the underworld. There is no day, there is no night. There is only black and red. And as you sit on this obsidian fence post, it is this black and red light that shines down on you, 
as you watch the beasts graze, as you keep an eye on them, make sure they don't wander too far. And you see a Bo Yi, a goat-like creature with nine fox tails, no eyes in the front, and various eyes on its back, start to hobble off. And you know what you have to do, the vocal exercise you need to invoke to bring them back. And its ear flicks in your direction, it cocks its head up, and it kind of wanders back to the flock. And we see other such uh, hellish monsters. We see Zhong Ming Niao, large raptors with two irises in each eye. We see Dao Lao Gui, miniature bulls made of bone with frills of poison darts. And one that seems to take a particular interest in you, a Dao Shou, a tiger-like creature. But when we turn, we see not a snout, not a muzzle, not sharp fangs, but a person's face, a mortal's face. It's an illusion, of course. This isn't actually a mortal with a tiger's body. It is a tiger with a man's face. And yet, as the Dao Shou comes up to you, tilts his head to the side, and then to the other side, unblinking, Litany sees themselves. This job, Litany, is like a broken-toothed lion being sent to do a sheepdog's job. Everything about them is coiled and vicious. Everything about them is an illusion of life. Everything about them is almost mortal. And then the true bestial nature is betrayed as they chuff in your direction and turn. One day. One day you'll see that we're exactly the same. Guess not today though. Movement catches your eye. A shadow slinking between the trees at the bottom of this hill you find yourself on top of. A humanoid shadow. That's unusual. You're the only one out here. Litany counts all of their flock, finds the number correct, turns back toward the shadow. And the shadow steps out of the shade of this obsidian tree <laughs> that it's underneath, and you see a woman, a tall woman, a muscular woman, very well-defined physique, light brown skin, and she's moving with the gait of a confident wolf. She's got a cocksure face, a bright, alive expression, dark hair pulled up into a messy bun, and a mostly bare torso, barely concealed by a single sash, uh, tucked into their trousers, and you see well-defined top surgery scars underneath their pectorals, as well as a staff strapped behind their back. They are moving swiftly, purposefully, and like they don't want to be seen. They haven't noticed you yet. And there's something else. They're not a ghost. You recognize it instantly. At first, a strange kind of vibration through the air. What is that? And then you realize it's the beating of a heart thrumming in your ears. It's not coming from you. It's never come from you. It's coming from her. There's blood in her veins, blood that still runs. There's breath in her lungs, breath that still pumps in and out. She's alive, a living mortal in the underworld. Impossible. Impossible. The problem with sending a lion to do a sheepdog's job is that a lion cannot deny their hunt. There is no question in Litany's body when they push off the fence and wander away from the Daosho and the rest of their flock. There is no question as they begin to trail this living person, keeping that sound do 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 in their ears. It almost 
vibrates inside of them, fills them with some kind of life. Is this a purpose? <laughs> this is something. They can't deny themselves the simple pleasure of hunting her down. As you get closer to her, you notice details that you didn't see before, an urgency in her face, in her movements, but also an uncertainty, not timidity. You don't even know who this person is, but you have a feeling that timid is not a word in her lexicon at all. But there is an uncertainty. She is a fish out of water here. In fact, you see her rub her arms together a little as though she's cold down here in the underworld. And she pauses for a second to assess the situation and take in her surroundings. Whitney moves in. Now's the time. <whistles> Almost like they were calling to their flock. Whitney steps out into her eye view and turns to look at them. You shouldn't be here. Oh, uh. And the voice that comes out of her mouth is masculine, it is confident, and it's just a touch. Like it's not taking things too seriously, even though this is a serious situation. I no. I, oh no! I no! I, I I definitely belong here. I'm a I'm a I'm a ghost. Mm -hmm. So if you just let me be on my merry way, you know, you go off to whatever it is that you're doing. Are those animals? That God, way, they look kind of messed up, don't they? Is the broken river? You're not going that way. Ghosts can't ford the broken river one way or another, and you are very much alive. What? <laughs> what? No, I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm dead. I'm like uber, uber dead. I can hear your heartbeat. Okay, I lied. I'm a demon. I'm a demon. Demons have hearts. Yeah, You're look at me. A I'm a... You have no divinity of you. That's kind of rude. I mean, I think you look divine. I mean, actually, and she leans forward and you feel something strange. Magic thrumming in her eyes. Though those dark irises don't change color or glow or anything like that, her eyes travel down to your chest, and it's almost as though you feel a strange radiance humming between your ribs. She's not looking at you. She's looking through you, underneath you, at something beneath the surface. It feels almost invasive. Cultivator. You're a cultivator. What are you doing here? Uh, I'm lost. I'm lo I wandered here by accident, you know, just kind of walked down a riverbank. I didn't know it was the shattered riverbank. Fell in, swept me down here, and uh, here I am. I'm just trying to find my way home. So, uh, not you've got a... What? Not possible. What? <sighs> Anything's possible when you've got a will and a way, and I've got a way here, Obsidian Fields, and a will. Me, I'm alive. Ah, well, if you could keep it on the down low, I would appreciate it. What the hell's wrong with your soul? What? I've got this like soul fire gaze thing. It's like a cultivation technique I picked up from this old guy in the mountains. Well, he was a monkey, is a monkey. He's still alive, I think. I mean, this was like 150 years ago and they really don't live that long. But anyway, I can see your soul and it's, it's pretty fucked up. Litany does something that they've been waiting a hundred years to do. They punch someone in the face. <laughs> Would you like to unleash violence? <laughs> yes, I would like to unleash violence. Okay, uh, inflict violence, actually. So when you inflict violence on someone, roll 2d6, and you add one for each true statement. They wish you harm. They do not. You're desperate? I'm not desperate. It's personal? Yes. Yeah, like, I mean, she's talking smack about your soul. All right, roll it them bones. Plus one. That's a 10. Again. That's an overkill. So you lose yourself to righteous fury. I will tell you the costs of your divinity. If you have a cool idea too, feel free to pitch it to me as well. Otherwise, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. <sighs> Litany hits like a truck. Litany hits like somebody who has been waiting for the opportunity to throw a punch for a hundred years. Litany is someone who throws a punch like a loaded gun that has not been shot in eons, who has a purpose that has not been fulfilled. Litany hits hard. And they want to pop her soul 
<laughs> out of her body just to see how she feels. You punch her in the chest? I punch her square in the chest. <laughs> and it cocks back and boom! She slides across the ground and hits a tree, which is unusual. Most people you punch, usually their bodies don't hold up. You punch a hole through them, or they, they literally go arcing through the air and you don't see them anymore. She slides, she takes it, lets out a oh, kind of impact noise. Oof, oof. Uh, she hits a tree and glass shards rain down and kind of cut her a little bit. She goes, oh, oh what the hell? Oh, I hate this place. Oh, okay, wow, you can really punch. You shouldn't be here. You've got a mean right hook, I gotta tell you that. Oh. Nobody living should be here, Ooh. so I'll fix the problem. Huh? I'll make you dead. What? And Lightning charges at her. <laughs> okay, you did get a 10 plus. So I think there's a moment where you come at her with the intent to kill. Yes. <laughs> you try to kill her on sight? Okay, yeah. So you come wailing in, fists flying, right? Every punch aimed at vital organs, aimed to rupture, to make her bleed, to make her die. And she takes a few more to the gut, to the shoulder, to the thigh, even when your leg comes in. And then she doesn't start fighting back but she starts parrying. Her arm goes up and catches a blow. Her leg comes up, she pivots, she dodges, she swings, she's not fighting back. And her form is really good. Uh, like really, really good. She's able to keep up with you and guard her vital places. And she was even able to tank like three strong hits straight to the body. She's not down yet. You don't even really see her bleeding, but she's breathing really heavily. Uh, and you have a feeling that some of those punches are gonna bruise, which makes you feel really good. She doesn't even quite reach for the staff yet. And she's saying, whoa, 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 whoa. let's just talk this out, okay? If it doesn't have to come to blows, I don't wanna fight, I don't wanna hurt you, okay? I don't wanna do something I might regret. There is an endless, an endless sea of rage underneath Litany. They punch so hard and they never get tired. Every hit that she takes, that she parries, is just as hard as the one came, that came before it, if not harder. They are like letting go of any inhibition and just hitting her because she can take it. Mm. Because she is strong and there's a recognition of that strength and they pull back just for a moment. <gasps> Ow, okay, yeah, that's really gonna smart in the morning. Listen, I'm just trying to get out of here, okay? Not through the painful way, but through the, hopefully the peaceful way. I just need to find my way out. If you could just point me in the direction of an ascension gate, I'll be on my merry way. Just the part ways here and you can maybe smack my ass on the way out if you wanted to. Don't actually do that. I feel like you would crack my tail and you see her tail swish out from behind her. She has a long monkey-like tail ending in a tufted uh, tip like a lion's. Who are you? <laughs> My name is Tian Sheng. I am a cultivator. I am a martial mage, as you have very cleverly ascertained. And you're right, I don't belong down here. I'm just found my way here by... She pauses. Accident. And I would appreciate your directions to get out of here. I've been here for three weeks. Please, everything is so cold. <sighs> You're not getting out of here. But you do know where the Ascension Gate is, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> and you go back to fighting her. And as she dodges and parries, she's forced to unsheath her staff to like block the brunt of the blows now. This feels good. This feels good. Litany hasn't felt good in a hundred years. This feels right. This is their purpose. They are a weapon with no enemy. And this feels right in a way that their soul sings with. The violence in them is so strong. Those tenants start rising into the back of their mind. Show no mercy, no, no pain, kill or be killed. Even when their fist connects with that staff and their knuckles crack against it, it feels good. Mm, I think there's a moment where she like braces her staff up and your fist is just connected. 
Oh my God. And she like is pushed back a few feet. Oh, wow. Okay, you hit like a hurricane. I'll give you that. You're a very strong fighter. And are you just getting stronger or is that just me? Or And she flips her staff with agility that doesn't even quite b- befit her muscular form. How can someone so big and muscular be so quick and agile on her feet? She spins around and now she attacks. Not to kill you, you recognize the intention immediately. You're a trained killer. This isn't the move of a killer. This is the maneuver of someone trying to knock you out so she can get out of here. She uses the uh, staff as a fulcrum and swings her legs forward to hit your head. Oh, back then. (laughs) It goes over and then she swings back around and uses the staff as a follow-up as she hits the ground with her feet, tries to knock you in the solar plexus. Litany doesn't dodge. Litany bears the brunt and they don't feel the pain. They okay. block and they hold. <sighs> Listen, I've got some pretty urgent business to attend to up there. You know, I've been hearing some pretty uh, scary things down here. <clears throat> you know, disguised as a rock in the necromantic palace. <clears throat> some stuff about the queen, you know, going up to the city of heaven. So I gotta get out of here before she does that. What? And she is able to hit them because for just a moment, Litany falters. The staff comes down on your head so hard, it feels like you've been cracked open by a thunderbolt. Bam! <laughs> oh shit, I thought you were gonna block that. You blocked every other one, are you okay? What did you just say? Uh, I said I thought you would block that. No, before that. You hit like a hurricane? After that. I was a rock? Do not make me ask a third time, what did you say about the queen? Oh, what plan? It's just, you know, everyone in the royal court's been talking about it. Uh, Something about how Queen Tigu plans to attack the emperor one last time. She's gathering all her strength in preparation for the ghost festival, which is apparently when her powers are the strongest. Makes sense. She's like the ghost ruler, ghost festival. You know, it's very thematic, Uh, which is in like 12 days, which is not a lot of time. Uh, The demons are calling it her last stand, her, what was the word? Her last hope. So I gotta get out of here before she does that because things on Yalan are gonna be fucking wild if she goes up and attacks the emperor. And I was there the last time gods had a conflict, you know, about like uh, 200 years ago at this point, it was not pretty. The mortals suffer and the mortals need a good ruler and I need to help a good ruler. I, 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 I'm rambling. Shh. Stop. Okay. Okay, you not attacking me is somehow scarier than you attacking me and trying to kill me, so, um... What's going on? How certain are you? I was a rock for three days, okay? Like, my... My ass was pretty cramped by the end, so I'm really certain about what I heard. Queen... Sigu... will go to the City of Heaven herself. Yes, that's what they're saying. Personally to attack her sister one last time. She'll die. I guess, yeah. She'll die. Are you okay? How did you get down here? Uh, that's a long story. Um, I was smacked. I was smacked really hard. Yep. And then her eyes go wide to look at something that had fallen out of her outfit while you were fighting. And she didn't notice it until this moment. Like it it catches both of your eyes in the glint of the crimson light coming down. And you see it, a river seal, just like the one your mother has, but much smaller, a small shard instead of a large one. And this woman, this Tiansheng, this cultivator, her eyes go wide. And she grabs for it. Okay, so if you're both trying to grab for it, I need you to tempt, either tempt fate or act impulsively to snatch it. Act impulsively. Okay, describe the emotion that drives you and answer one. The GM will tell you something you didn't notice until now as they answer the other. And the questions are what advantage do you see or what trouble hits you hard and fast? The emotion that drives litany as they lunge both hands out not caring about how they'll land reaching desperately for that river seal is that exact thing Mm. desperation everything is coming together in their minds so fast their mother 
their mother who they could never name as a mother, the person who created them. Her last hope, her last stand, she can't do that. Litany was made so that she wouldn't have to do that. Litany was supposed to be the last hope. She will die. Oblivion will take her if she goes up there. That cannot come to pass. And it's their fault. But if they have a river seal, if they have a way out of the underworld, maybe, 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 just maybe, maybe they could do it. Maybe they could get their redemption. Hmm. Maybe they could have it. Maybe they could have that second chance. Maybe they could prove to her their devotion. They see it. They have always seen. They have always walked that clear line from beginning to end. There are no other options. So it's desperation. Hmm. And not only that, it's purpose. And the advantage I would like to see you is I would like to get there first. You do. Your fingers go out and scoop at the edges of that shattered river seal, and I will answer what trouble hits you hard and fast. Your fingers go right through. You can try again if you'd like. Desperately. Clawing at it. No. No. They go through. <laughs> What magic is this cultivator? What? I, no magic. It's a, it's a, and she reaches forward and picks it up. It's a mortal river seal, so only mortals can hold it, which means you're a demon? That's not quite right. That's not the soul of a demon. You're not quite a mortal though, either. Are you a cultivator? But no. cultivators are mortal. I am not a cultivator. I am not a demon, and I am not a god. I am Litany, daughter of Queen Tsigu, the first fallen, beginning of the end, lord of death, sovereign on low of the underworld, the Silver Tzilian. Oh shit. I didn't know she had a daughter. Wow, okay. Wait, why are you hurting like evil sheep? You know, if you're like her daughter, give that to me. I can't! Look! And it falls right through your hand and she catches it with her other. You literally can't hold it, only a mortal can. Me. Or any other mortal. But I'm the only one that would fit the bill down here. You know, I'm the only living, breathing mortal down here. Look, I'm, I'm sorry about your mom going up on that suicide mission. Ugh, and I'm sorry you're out here hurting these evil- Do you want to get out of here? Yes, I do, desperately. You want to leave the underworld? Please, yes. Not the painful way though. Is that a way of you saying you're about to kill me? No. Okay, I'm listening. You need to reach the mortal realm. I do, urgently. That river seal can't take me all the way to the city of heaven. No, it's a, it's a mortal seal, so it can only jump realms by a degree of one, something like that. I take you to the Ascension Gate. I let you leave the underworld with your life. And in return, you will take me to the very first Ascension Gate on the mortal realm, and you will ascend me to the City of Heaven. What's in the City of Heaven for you? My destiny. Okay. Daughter of Tsigu? Litany. Litany? Litany. That's a weird name for a person. It's like the name of a weapon or something. Litany. You've got yourself a deal. She tucks the river seal into her sash, pats it down. And if you try to betray me, as many mortals have betrayed, one another. I will drag you back to the underworld, kicking and screaming, and I will make sure you never leave. And Tianzhong's tail puffs out behind her and she stands stock still. Understood. Got yourself a deal. 
What are you doing? We're, we're, sh we're shaking hands on the deal. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it, is this your first time, like, interacting with a person? You are the only living mortal who has ever descended into the underworld. Uh-huh. Right, I'm starting to catch on to that. Just spit into your hand and shake mine. <laughs> All right. Whew. It's really cold. Or spit, I mean. Anyway, take me to the ascension gate. Keep up. Let's go. Thank you so much for tuning in to God Killer Last Hope. If you've been enjoying this series, please consider joining Transplainer's Patreon at patreon.com slash transplanerrpg. It's the best way to support us for as little as $3 a month, so we can continue bringing great performances like this one. If you can't spare the funds, please consider leaving a positive review or comment posting about us on social media, or sharing the show with a friend that you think will enjoy us. Thanks to the support of our audience, we are continually able to do this awesome work. And you can purchase the ash can of Godkiller RPG on itch.io backslash by Connie Chong. The games for release will be published through Evil Hat Productions in 2025. And as always, our sponsors for this series are Frivolous Bear Studios and Hero Forge. Thank you for helping us create these powerful stories. And with that, our game comes to a close for now. We'll see you next time, right here on Transplanter RPG.